So today, uh, I want to talk a bit about the different use ways in which data is actually important for your machine learning pipeline. Probably most of you are aware that data is super critical, like data quality, uh, preparing your data is super important to get proper output for your machine learning models and proper quality for your machine learning models. But on the other hand, also just capturing metadata is very crucial to actually run and operate a machine learning pipeline in a production environment. So we're kind of going to talk about those different ways. And another way in which you might see that, we're going to talk about the way in which NoSQL databases, such as graph databases, document databases, full text search engines, uh, are having an impact on machine learning. And basically those two fields, first of all, for feature engineering. So how can I actually use it as part of my machine learning pipeline? So this is probably more appealing to data scientists. And then on the other hand, we're going to look at, as the title promises, like uh, what does it take for machine learning infrastructure? And here we're actually going to take a look at the metadata uh, we might want to capture across our metadata, uh, across our pipeline. This is actually captured under an open source initiative called Arango ML, Arango Machine Learning. And we'll learn a bit more about the heritage about this project throughout this talk. But basically, it's an open source project which actually allows me to do both of that. Uh, leverage NoSQL databases for uh, feature pre-processing or data pre-processing for machine learning. And on the other side, capture machine learning metadata across uh, various uh, pipelines you might want to build. I'm Jörg, I'm uh, the Head of Engineering and Machine Learning over at ArangoDB, and previously I always have been switching back and forth between the database world and like machine learning infrastructure or large uh, large scale infrastructure world. So switching back and forth between uh, databases in my PhD, then I was over at SAP for HANA, then I built large scale machine learning frameworks over at uh, Mesosphere and Suki AI, which is like a healthcare uh, startup. And uh, what I kind of like about my current role is that it's combining both those passions. So I can both work on the database side, but also integrate and merge that together with uh, the machine learning world. All right, uh, maybe just uh, why is machine learning taking off nowadays? So we always imagine like, hey, just with TensorFlow, everyone can actually become into a superhero and program really cool models. This is mainly due to the fact, so why is it the right time right now, that we actually have large amounts of data. Secondly, we got the computing capabilities available, like large data centers, uh, cloud environments where you can easily get uh, large deployments, and also uh, recent advances, especially in like deep neural networks from an algorithmic side. And this actually allows us to train like self-driving cars. There's this like a deep Bach, which actually is composing music, which I find pretty indistinguishable from like real Bach music. So it's pretty cool what we can do all with uh, machine learning nowadays. So. Just kind of the naive view, and I always hear that when people are starting with a new machine learning project, all, even in big companies, it's like, I'm just going to hire a data scientist. The data scientist is going to sit there, leverage uh, his laptop together with TensorFlow. I give him some data. He's writing this cool model. We need to train it, obviously. But then we're done, and we have this cool model, and this data scientist can actually approach the next big challenge. Unfortunately, in reality, this looks very different. So this is from a paper by Google. So those people actually have a lot of experience with machine learning. But even for them, the machine learning coding is actually just a small box in the middle. And actually, the real challenges of productionizing machine learning models, so not just coming up with like one model, but actually putting that in production is basically all those bigger boxes around the small black box here. And so, I believe uh, what we should actually do as a community, and I believe the metadata aspect is like one part of this, is actually work together as a community and define like data science principles. Similar as we have like software engineering principles like CICD, testing patterns, and everything else, I believe if we work together as a community, we can actually structure this picture much better and uh, work together Whereas currently, I actually see a lot of people reinventing that from scratch and trying to come up with their own way of uh, doing such things. There are actually other people like Ian Goodfellow like uh, agreeing with that. And I think this is something where we as community should really work together and hence move the 
uh, AI or actually more the operability of AI forward with best practices we share. And I guess the first uh, best practice uh, I see is, as mentioned, like people start hiring the superheroes, the data scientists. But actually the superhero isn't very powerful if he doesn't have like side gigs, um, which can actually help him uh, manage this entire big map here. Because for a data scientist, often coming from a background, mathematical background, dealing with large scale distributed systems, scaling computation, often is like not their core strengths. And this is why actually we need to work together as a team in solving this challenge. And I guess uh, most prominently what we've seen over the past probably two years, there's been this new role. It's kind of like the DevOps role for data science. And this is basically like data ops, data engineer. There are different names out there. But this is a person actually combining data science skills together with like distributed systems engineering. So kind of a mix of computer science and uh, mathematics. And this person, this uh, persona can actually help to build this entire infrastructure uh, operate it and make sure we actually are efficiently implementing that. So this is probably like the first takeaway I would like to give people. Really think about operating your platform and not just hire a data scientist. And yeah, if we actually divide this map then between our different personas, the data scientist can actually really focus on the data itself. So feature extraction, feature engineering, writing machine learning models, writing uh, analysis uh, on like how efficient different models are, whereas the other two people, like a more traditional system admin, a DevOps person can take care of the infrastructure, and our data engineer, data ops, can actually take care of the data aspects uh, around our um, yeah, machine learning platform. So what typically comes out if we start such initiative, we end up building a machine learning pipeline with more or less those different steps here. So on the left side, we got data, basically how do we store, how do we manage our incoming raw data, and then comes the next step, this is the feature engineering. And this is actually where data scientists are probably spending most of their time this involves data cleanup, extracting core values out of uh, the raw data, basically transforming the raw data into something which we can actually leverage and input into a machine learning framework. Then comes the actual model training. So there is what we actually expected. This is a small black box here, where we have something like TensorFlow, Spark, PyTorch, MXNet, or whatever our favorite uh, machine learning framework is. And we basically train a bunch of different models. So also to keep in mind, we typically not only train like one model for a given problem, we train up, up to like in the range of tens to 50 different models for different hyperparameters, for different ways to try out things. And the next step is then typically I end up with a library of different models. So also keep in mind this might actually improve over time. I might get new input data, I might get new training data, uh, I might get a new model by my data scientist. So actually I end up with like a large library of different models I've trained. And the big task is then how do I select the one I actually want to use in production for serving. So which one do I want to leverage to actually solve the real business problem I'm having on the right side in uh, model serving. So there are uh, multiple actually open source pipelines available. Probably uh, the most prominent one is a TensorFlow Extended or short TFX, uh, which has been built around by Google around the TensorFlow ecosystem. And you can already see this pretty much matches to what we saw earlier. We got data on the left side, we got some transformations or feature engineering in the middle, we got our training in the middle, and then we got model management and model serving more going to the right side. Uh, very similar and actually related in many aspects, it's a uh, Kubeflow pipelines. So Kubeflow was originally a way to deploy TensorFlow on Kubernetes, but it actually has grown into a very large ecosystem of different projects around machine learning, uh, model serving, uh, around feature stores. So there we actually basically are trying to uh, build a similar ecosystem as uh, in TensorFlow Extended. And there actually there's a lot of interaction between both communities as well. Um, also here, we actually, I think I have a boost here, it's Logical Clocks Hops, it's also an open source platform. Pretty much, again, following the similar steps, we got data ingest, data preparation, 
uh, experiments and train and then deploy on the right side. So we actually got a number of different open source options out here to actually build our pipeline. And now, as promised, we want to talk about how NoSQL databases kind of fit into this picture. And I guess the kind of obvious answer is like on the data and uh, streaming side, taking care of our data, storing out our data. So probably not so interesting to actually go into much more detail here. But what's actually more interesting is the feature engineering aspect. As mentioned earlier, this is actually where data engineers are taking most of their time, taking raw data and turning it into something TensorFlow or something else can actually start doing something with. What are the typical steps here? First of all, uh, we have to actually clean up our data. There might be missing data, there might be different, for example, time or date formats, different units for uh, distances, and so on and so on. Everything you learn when you live in the US to love and hate. And the other thing is, uh, I might actually also have to transform it into something which can be understood by my machine learning framework. So typically, uh, TensorFlow and others, they work with, for example, TF records, which is basically like a tabular format uh, of input data. So if my data is actually a JSON document or a graph or a key value store, I probably have to do something to turn it into something meaningful, uh, which can be understood by TensorFlow and actually processed in an efficient way. So for example, if we take a graph, we then turn that over into, uh, for example, extracting the number of movies made by each director if we want to predict something like, hey, which director should we actually choose for our next uh, blockbuster movie? So we need to extract features from a graph which can be easily understood by humans, but not so well yet uh, by machines. Uh, so we'll also see a bit uh, there's research in that area later on, but uh, this would be, for example, a typical step in feature engineering. Um, talking about different data models, why does it actually make sense to have different data models, um, such as JSON, graphs, key value? And I guess the most uh, important aspect here is that we also have to think about how data is represented for us as humans. And uh, so, for example, it's very easy for us to think about graphs, to think about uh, different connections between entities rather than like a big table. And it also often makes it much easier to express certain queries, uh, for example, graph traversals. Finding out everyone who's connected with us, finding out all the models we will see later on related to a data set. This is an easy graph question, but it can end up being becoming like a really annoying join if we want to express that in SQL. Um, and this is kind of the one thing we're working on with ArangoDB uh, is that we have actually seen in the past there, there are specialized databases. Probably most of you, you know Mongo, Neo4j, uh, Redis, for example, which basically help us to solve like one of those data models here. The challenge in real life is actually for most use cases that one data model isn't sufficient. I typically, I need kind of a mix of both of them and then I actually, end up having my engineers write a lot of code, basically merging data from my graph uh, database with my document database, and I often even end up re-implementing a lot of database functionality on top. And that was the kind of motivation behind ArangoDB. It's an open source multi-model database. So it natively supports uh, all those different data models inside one core engine. Uh, it's distributed so graphs can actually spend multiple nodes. And also for usability, there's just like one SQL-like language which actually allows us to query across all those data models. So I have a uniform access to all of that. I promise this is the only ArangoDB slide, so I'll also move forward uh, to the next slide. As mentioned, this especially the topic of graphs and machine learning. This is where the connection of NoSQL databases or different data models and machine learning probably is most obvious. So if we just search like Google, we find a lot of different things uh, about like knowledge graphs and how we can connect deep learning and knowledge graphs or graphs in general. And I think this is coming from this fact that for us as humans, a lot of things can be easily expressed as a graph. So if we go back to this movie example, this is actually a Kaggle data set. So Kaggle is like a platform for data scientists for 
like competitions. And you can actually also learn a lot by just playing with those data sets. So if we have this data set here, and uh, this is originally here in a tabular format, but for us as humans, if we want to think about those different entities, so for example, there's, uh, there are different records like uh, for example, a director is appearing like multiple times in here. But if we as humans are thinking about them, we're actually thinking about the connection of a movie. If you think of a given movie, it's connected to a director. And that director is actually its own instance, which again can also be connected to other movies or even other actors uh, by that. Because, for example, Tarantino is always choosing like his favorite actors. So there might be uh, also different connections in there. So for us as humans, it's very natural to think in like a graph-like structure. Um, and what's also really interesting is basically how can we, this is kind of like the next forward step uh, where a lot of research is happening right now, is how can we actually combine this world of deep neural nets together with graphs? And this is the kind of area of graph neural networks. And this can then also involve like, how can we leverage uh, machine learning to predict edges in a graph? How can we predict uh, machine learning to leverage labels? So basically, how can machine learning deep neural networks natively deal with graphs? So I think this is very interesting, because then we don't have to do this feature step in between where we actually need to manually extract features. But we can leave it up to the machine learning framework to extract the valuable information uh, from, from a network. Um, as mentioned, we also wanted to talk about not just graphs, but actually the other ways in which we can uh, leverage data or which in which we need to leverage data as a data scientist. And this is where then different processing capabilities come in. So we can do, for example, graph queries, we can do graph traversals. But on the other hand, what's super powerful, even in just feature engineering, is, for example, natural language processing. Going back to our movie data set, imagine we want to find all the Batman and Robin movies. So we want to issue a full text query and actually find all the different movies, uh, which concludes there. And then we could, for example, leverage a graph query to find all the connected directors again for those movies. Uh, another aspect about uh, features, as we talked about how we can derive features, is feature reusability. And keep in mind that it takes up to like 60, 70% of a data scientist's time to actually clean the data and develop those features. So actually reusability is a very important concept. And here the idea of feature catalogs or feature stores has become quite prominent. So a feature store basically allows me to reuse features which a previous data scientist has worked on. Imagine I'm at Airbnb. Data scientist one is coming up with some kind of user representation, some kind of transformation he uses to clean that data set, to extract the feature describing a user. And then I'm the next person, the next data scientist who needs to work on a similar problem like predicting which, uh, what might be booked by several users. Then it's probably a good starting point at least to take that feature and not derive everything from scratch. So good feature store, and this is, uh, is a screenshot, for example, from Logical Clocks again, we're outside, is uh, I can actually discover features which have been worked on by other data scientists before. I got versioning, consistency, and I can also have uh, caching, so I don't have to compute that always from scratch, which can also take a lot of time for large data sets. Okay, uh, let's actually move to the second part uh, where, or the third part actually, where databases are super useful in our machine learning framework. And this is actually by managing this entire pipeline in one go. Um, and for that, let's, uh, like one motivating example for me, and that actually brought me to back to join ArangoDB a while ago, uh, was I was working in building machine learning pipelines for finance and healthcare. And we often had problems like we needed an audit trail, like how, where did this model come from, which data sets were used to train it, but also the other way around, like we were dealing with patient data and we needed to be able to identify which models were impacted by this one patient record. For example, because that patient was withdrawing uh, his consent for us to use his data, and then under GDPR it's a bit unclear whether uh, if it's concerning the original data set, it actually translates over to the model. Uh, but there can always be information exposed. For example, here this is shown in this paper. Um, throughout uh, in the final model from the original data set. So at least we wanted to be able to identify 
which models um, were impacted or trained by this like one single record. And this actually turned out to be a pretty hard problem because each of those steps had its own metadata. We knew where a data set was stored. We knew when doing feature engineering, like which of those stored data sets was used. We knew then when doing model training, uh, which features had been used. Uh, we knew then when uh, storing a model, like from which training run did that come. And then also on the model serving side, we knew like, hey, we use this stored model. But this actually turned out to be like us manually joining data from uh, five to six different systems to actually figure out like, hey, those models were impacted and we might have to withdraw those models from our production environment. And as mentioned, like this actually is related to a number of other challenges. So for example, just understanding the provenance, the lineage of a model is important for a lot of audit trails, especially in finance. This was like a very crucial thing. Um, and also just being able to, for a data scientist to see like, hey, which reusable steps were used there? We already saw this concept uh, about a feature store. I want to reuse things which other data scientists have done before. So I also need to be able to discover that. So just being a data scientist and saying like, hey, those, this Jupyter notebook, those features, those data sets were used to train this is a very powerful tool. And this is actually when we started into looking, uh, looking into building a common metadata store. So um, as mentioned, like there's often like individual metadata stores for each of those pipelines, but we were at that time really missing this common layer which we could join across all of that. And maybe just uh, to get like a common term here, let's just define what we mean by talking about metadata. So metadata, so this is the Kubeflow uh, definition, uh, is actually just describing information about runs, models, data sets. So it's not the data set itself, but it's for example a description of uh, this data set has this size, has this name, uh, is stored here, and uh, has version X, Y, Z, and thereby I can figure out that there's a newer one of that. Similarly with like training runs, with training runs, of course, a really important metadata is like training performance, test performance, um, and also with like notebooks, features, and everything else. So it's basically like a description of different entities, uh, but not the entity itself. And this actually led us to build a RangoML pipeline. So a RangoML pipeline is a common extensible metadata layer. Um, we basically have seen that it's not really good if we would build it for like one particular pipeline. So for example, just for TFX or just for Kubeflow, simply because uh, most people actually vary a little bit in how they implement their pipeline. So we want it to be both extendable and flexible and not being tied to like one particular model. And so we ended up creating this open source project based on uh, a RangoDB. And why did we choose a RangoDB here? So a RangoDB, we talked a little bit about this idea of multi-model data. And this actually turns out with machine learning metadata, this is a really good use case for me also to explain multi-model. Why is it important? And what we actually saw is when we started out, we started using a document store. And this was worked really nicely because the individual metadata items for each pipeline stage for each entity really nicely fit in like a document. Like model training, different machine learning frameworks have different outputs, so I got different metadata from like my TensorFlow framework, from my MXNet framework, so I could easily model that into like a JSON document and store that. Just turns out that uh, modeling the connection between different entities became a lot harder that way. So we actually wanted to model the structure in between as graphs. We wanted to say like this JSON document describing my experiment, my training run uh, from yesterday is related to this feature. This feature is related to this uh, JSON document describing a different transformation. This is related to a different data set. So basically, uh, we wanted to bring up this graph structure, and this is why we then, in the end, ended up choosing a RangoDB, because it allowed us to be flexible here and leverage both the document uh, store for storing this uh, unstructured data, but on the other hand, also have a structured connection in between by leveraging a graph. And using that actually queries like which models are being impacted by like this one data set actually turns out to be a simple graph traversal, so or reachability. 
Uh, we start with one data set and then it's basically a graph tree which models can be reached here. And for that, just keep in mind that it's not always this linear chain, but a feature might actually also depend on a different feature, or a model might actually be also trained uh, on top of another model by using transfer learning. So you actually also have a lot of loops there, which uh, makes like just writing like a long SQL statement for this, if you would store that in a relational store, pretty, pretty difficult. Um, and yeah, so basically uh, just leveraging the graph structure, a lot of those things we needed to answer also like audit trails for a given model turn out to be a simple graph tree which I can easily express. And this uh, over time actually allowed for a number of different use cases for actually different personas. So originally we were actually uh, mostly targeting like the data ops engineer who needed to take care of like, hey, this is the audit trail, this is the data lineage uh, for GDPR, because he had to answer those questions in our environment. But it actually turned out that this metadata was pretty useful for the other personas as well. So both, uh, for example, our data scientist here, he could easily find relevant entities for a model. So we had like a new data scientist, we onboarded, and we told him like, hey, can you please look at this model and improve it? And just by looking at the metadata, you could get like the uh, entire view of how that model has been trained in like one go, whereas previously he would have to go through like all the different systems or ask the people who had implemented that to tell him like which data set was used, for example. Um, it also helps to like search uh, whether someone already has done like a user feature and also it really helped them in the end to have like compare performance differences across different models because they can again, issue like a simple graph tree and then compare like training uh, or test performance across various models depending on uh, very flexible criteria. Then obviously, as mentioned, like the uh, data ops engineer or data engineer was our main persona. Uh, he could much easier do audit trails. He could track this lineage of data, identify what's impacted by what, and also it helped us to actually reach uh, reproducible model builds because we would store like random seeds and other things as just attributes in, in that graph structure. Uh, and that actually helped us to be able to rebuild models uh, more or less uh, with the same outcome, uh, which is, uh, was a pretty hard problem. And then we always got like from compliance, they were pretty annoyed that we had different model performance in the end. And also uh, it really helped us in production. Uh, there was this problem of a data shift. So data shift basically occurs if your production data uh, ends up having, for example, different distributions over time, there are new attack vectors, or simply like just a new usage pattern you haven't seen in your training data. And this often means that your model you have trained is not applicable to that data anymore because it just uh, has different characteristics. And uh, this was previously pretty hard to detect. And by keeping track of that metadata also for the serving environment, basically like which requests do we get, uh, we were able to always compare the distribution and characteristics of the training data set to the data we would be seeing in production. And uh, this would also, for example, trigger like a rebuild of models once we saw this was getting out of hand or out of like a certain range. Also for the more traditional uh, DevOps or system administrator, it proved to be very useful simply because uh, we could do resource accounting. We would know like how many teams, uh, how many hours training, for example, models teams had spent because that's also something uh, we would uh, simply monitor and hence also translate to like cost, like how much had they spent on training this one model, how much had a team spent on solving a particular problem, which was very helpful also in uh, allocating different resources. Also for permission tracking, we can basically see is a data scientist, for example, able to see all the different entities involved in, uh, in like training a model, or he actually can't work on a certain problem because he, he is not allowed to access a data set. All right, uh, maybe just diving a bit into Orango ML here. So how did we solve that problem in the end? So um, basically this is the schema, so to speak, uh, we came up with for Orango ML. And schema, so to speak, is mostly because there is no fixed schema. We came up with a number of entities 
uh, which we felt useful were, uh, for most machine learning platforms. But in the end, everyone can simply like define a new feature, a new entity in that schema, and actually also change connections in between because it's simply like a graph structure. So I can, for example, directly move, uh, if I'm not using notebooks, I can directly move from like a feature to a model function uh, depending on my workflow at my company. So as mentioned, there is no fixed schema, but we have some entities which just have better support in the UI or are kind of like first class citizens. Um, a Wrangler ML, it comes with uh, different APIs. So uh, we have a Python package available. Uh, you can just leverage from your, like, your favorite uh, notebook or your favorite data science environment. We got an HTTP environment uh, for cases where you are not working in a Python environment. And we are also just finalizing our TensorFlow extended integration. And I think I have a slide for that upcoming. So basically, if you're using TFX, it's all automatically stored uh, in, into a Rango ML if you want to leverage that. Um, this then is a first screenshot of the UI. It allows you to, for example, find models or deployments. Uh, it allows you to uh, track and also lineages. So once I've found something in particular, I can actually see everything which is related to an experiment, uh, related to a deployment. And the next version will actually allow you to then also double click on model and then also deep dive into there. So again, this gives me a really easy insight into everything which is involved there. And uh, again, we as humans like graphs make it really easy to comprehend how certain things are connected. So this is why we wanted to have another graph representation in here, uh, making it easy for people to understand the connections between different entities. Uh, as mentioned, like uh, TFX, so TensorFlow Extended, kind of has its own way uh, in uh, adding uh, metadata storage. So they actually announced that after we started that project, and originally I was pretty annoyed, because we were like, hey, we tried to solve that. But in the end, it turns out to be a pretty good uh, fit, because this is very targeted to the TensorFlow extended, to the TensorFlow ecosystem. Those APIs, uh, you don't really want to code them by hand. It involves a lot of gRPC calls, a lot of generations. And in the end, they actually defined an interface which allows us to easily plug ourselves down there. So this is basically, just imagine that last box being uh, a Rango ML down here. And uh, we'll release that probably within the next months. And hence, we can easily integrate into that ecosystem as well. Uh, the other uh, projects are also catching up with metadata. I think here there's the alpha version notice, and we're actually working together with that community as well on the metadata tracking. But this problem of metadata is actually coming up on a lot of those different machine learning uh, platforms or pipelines, because it's typically required for uh, production-grade scenarios, and also for anything involving audit trails or something similar. So whenever I got compliance coming into the picture, I somehow need this metadata and uh, be able to trace back of what has happened uh, for building this model. All right, thanks for listening. I actually uh, just, I got six minutes left. Uh, I can just briefly show you because this is all open source. So if you just go to like uh, a Rango pipe, slides are uh, will also be online after this talk. So links are going to be in there. There are just Jupyter notebooks you can run. If I reconnect to my session, let's see if it reconnects. But basically, that entire example is here for you to run from from a Jupyter notebook. Um, Here's the UI, we can search things, uh, we can explore whatever we have done in, in our models. And then the last thing I briefly wanted to show is kind of the implementation details for those entities. And this is basically the way in which a RangoDB is dealing uh, with those different entities. So you might see there collections are kind of like the table acronym for inside a RangoDB because it's not just tables, it's collection of entities. So uh, collections. And uh, here we have the overview of all collections uh, with all the default entities involved. And you can see there are two different kinds of ways in which things are represented. So those are kind of like documents. And so for example, here's a document describing a deployment. And 
then we got those kind of like edges. So edges are describing how things are connected. And because those two entities are actually independent of each other, uh, I can uh, have this flexibility of always adding new edges, of adding new entity types, uh, without being constrained to like one particular schema, to one particular setup. All right, uh, with that, I think because we are also at uh, our plant limits, yes, uh, shortly. Um, I would just leave it up for some questions. Otherwise, feel free to just find me somewhere afterwards. And thank you so much for listening. Three, two, one, no questions. Okay, I'll be down here. Thanks. <laughs>